Hallelujah. Go ahead and open your Bibles back up to the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. That is right after Galatians and right before uh, Philippians. Our text, in case you didn't hear this morning, uh, comes from the fourth chapter, the first through the sixteenth verses. And so uh, you can uh, be best go back to this morning. But I just tell you, wear your thick skin clothes for this morning. Amen. <coughs> Y'all are, well, at least y'all came back, so you guys were, had thick skin this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen, 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 amen. Praise God. Well, um, we were, talk, were talking about uh, growing up in the Christ, or growing up into Him. And uh, as we said this morning, just for a real, qu real quick recap, Ephesians is divided into two halves as far as, um, you know, understanding how the book was written. And um, the first half, the first three chapters deal with, uh, you, can, you can come up with several different terms, theological approach, it's the, the theological statements, it is the uh, Godward side, uh, you know, so forth, it is your positional truth. The second half deals with uh, manward side or the application of the truth. <clears throat> Without, let me say this, there's a lot of people who want to simply deal with, and they call it grace, and it is, they deal with the Godward side and forego anything else. Um, in essence, basically to them, the book of Ephesians only has three chapters. You know, what God did for you, how God did it, it's all just, you're all walking in it, yada, yada, yada. And the last three chapters where you got to do something, doesn't apply. Well, that's not true. Paul moved from that place, amen? He moved from that place, praise God of simply um, saying that, you know, well, all we had to do was be under God's blessings and God's grace. Now, there's more to it than that. I said there's more to it than that. Can you say amen? And uh, God wants us to do things. Hallelujah. Praise God. Uh, and uh, God wants us to live in certain ways. Praise God. And uh, I was looking, there was, there, was, there was a commentary in this uh, particular uh, study here. And... Um, and I, I missed it somewhere along the way. I was going to read it because it was really, really, really good. Hallelujah. Amen, 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 amen. Well, I will find it. Here we go. Um, Ephesians 1, which says, Paul says, I, I beseech you that you are worthy. Um, the word beseech is like, is, is the, um, in the first sentence, is emphasis. It is, um, the believer should cross the bridge from, listen to this, analysis. Remember, first three, three, three chapters are Godward side, theological side, to action. From theology to morality. From Christian faith to Christian life. In other words, and we're not talking about having faith in God. We're talking about, you know, a lot of times the, our tenets of what we believe and so forth are called the Christian faith. And so, from Christian, and just having tenets of faith to Christian life, living it. Amen. Um, from revelation of doctrine to the development of practice. Well, I've got a revelation. Well, that's great. Are you practicing it? James said what? Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Okay, so th those, those are the things that Paul said about this, you know, when he's talking about transitioning. That's the mindset that's coming out in that. Now, so we're talking, we got through, we got down through verse 16, and, well, 15 of um, this chapter, where, and it said, For the whom, from whom the whole body fitly joined together, compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And, um, you know, Look at verse 15 again. We, you know, be speaking the truth in love may grow up in him in all things. Verse 14, back up. We really need to get 14. I'm really after 14, 15, 16. That we henceforth be no more children. Tossed to and fro. That's instability. One of the things that God wants the believer to become is stable. Not flaky, sta not flaky, unstable, stable. Hello. It takes, it takes an effort to be stable. Praise God. So, we you no know, instability is um, the sign of immaturity. Now, you know, uh, think about kids. You know, what, what are you going to do? Well, I think I'm going to do this. I think I'm going to do that. And, and they'll change five minutes later. 
Hello? You know, in the 10th grade, they know what they're going to do for life. In the 11th grade, it's something different. 12th grade, it's something different. By the time they graduate, it's a whole different thing. You know? Well, I thought you were going to, well, that was, that was two grades ago. <laughs> you know? Actually, with kids, it was two minutes ago. Well, they call you and say, well, we're all going over to, um, we're all going over to Chili's to eat after school. Okay. You get a phone call. We're over at East Coast Wings. Well, what are you doing over East Coast Wings? I thought you were going to Chili's. Well, everybody changed their mind. You know, that, you know, or, or we're going to go see a movie. What movie are you going to go see? We're going to go see this one. You, call, you can say, what movie did you go to? We went to that one. Well, I thought you were going to this one. Well, everybody changed their mind. You know, and that's immaturity. That's, that's not stability. That's immaturity. God wants us to be stable. Amen. So, so we're not to be children tossed to and fro, uh, carried by every wind of doctrine. We talked about the cunning craftiness of men while they lie, while they lie in wait, but holding the truth in love. We started talking about this morning and may grow up into him in all things. Every area of our life should be growing up into Christ. Amen? Spiritually, mentally, physically, our lives should be growing up into Christ. And it says that he is the head, then it says from the, from the whole body fitly joined together. We are the body of Christ by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual, work, effectual working in the measure of every part. Now this kind of comes back to some of the things we talked about this morning, according to the effectual working of every part. When you got people sitting on one side of the church, Matt and somebody on the other side of the church, and the parts are not effectually working together, are they? Amen? I'm going to tell you something. It doesn't take a whole lot to short circuit uh, electricity or, or um, wire, wires on a sound board or whatever. You go back here, and, and y'all seen those little eight inch plugs or 3.5 millimeter plugs, the little bitty plugs, and you know, and they'll have them in stereo, and actually you have, even have some that work in iPods and some of your smartphones and stuff that are stereo, uh, the audio is stereo, and then it has a video on it. And on that little plug, there's, a, there's uh, on the stereo, there's two black lines, and on the audio, there's three. I mean, video audio combo, there's three, and they separate signals. Put them in there just a little bit wrong, and, and they'll, what happens? Messes it up. Don't put it in quite far enough. And we're not, only, we're not talking about really, you know, pushing it along. We're talking about uh, m uh, millimeters or a, mil a m half of a millimeter difference in what's right and wrong. Some of you are old enough to remember the infamous 8-track. Hallelujah. Today I saw something on Facebook. I had the picture. It had this picture of this little swirly thing with a hole in the middle. And it says, uh, do you, you see how old you are? Do you know what this is? Well, of course I knew what it was. <laughs> do you know what it was? It was a thing you put in 45 so you could play it on a regular uh, LP rack. Y'all remember those? Stuck them into your 45s and had the little bit of hole in the middle. You could put it on the LP rack. And you didn't have to put that big old adapter on your LP thing. Okay? Yeah, I went, well, that's what that is. Yeah, I had them. How many have one? How many had the adapter, that big old clunky thing you slid down over it and they didn't work half the time and they, they'd mess up? Yeah, and then, of course, you would stack them. That's right, you know. And drop three at a time. And then after a while, we get some in, you know, they would start sliding underneath. They would, it could, we couldn't keep spinning them. Well, you can't put 14 on there. Anyway, you might be able to stack them, but they won't work. Praise the Lord. How did I get off on that? Anyway, amen. But it doesn't take much. You know, it doesn't take much to mess something up. But I was going to say eight-track tapes. On eight tracks, you know, you, you remember this. There were, there were four, four sets of two stereo tracks on a tape about that wide. And you had this head that would read the first track, and then you hear click, click, and it would move down and pick up the second set. That would track two. And then you go click, and it moved down and pick up track three. Well, either if the if the eight track tape got inside and got, got just got off just a little bit on the inside of the casing, you'd hear it picking up two different tracks at the same time. We used to call that double tracking. Everybody remember that? Double tracking. I had an old Righteous Brothers, um, Best of the Righteous Brothers 8-track, uh, and I could hear you've lost that love and feeling, and you're my soul and inspiration at the same time. I mean, what, for Righteous Brothers fans, that was heaven. I mean, you know. <laughs> and, of course, they came out with the, Nobody Gets Too Much Heaven back in, in, in the 70s after they reunited. Uh, but you could double track, baby. What was it? Just a little bit off. Just a little bit off, it didn't work properly. And I'm telling you, the Bible tells us that we're to have every part effectually working together. You get people off and things won't work right. Why do you think Satan comes in constantly trying to disrupt the church so that it can't function properly? Are you here? 
constantly coming after the church. According to the working, in, uh, uh, according to the effectual working, effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So, uh, it is imperative that the body learn to be edifying one to the other instead of demanding your own rights. Now, I was pretty rough this morning. I, 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 you know, but you know what? It's time that somebody just slap some of us upside the head and say, get your stuff straight. You know, get your act together and quit, quit walking around, milly-mouthing and, 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 and fussing and complaining about how things are and how God's or, or, or wanting something your way all the time. This ain't Burger King, baby. Hello? You know, remember McDonald's, remember how many of you have been to McDonald's and they would only take stuff off, they would never add anything to their burgers years ago, they wouldn't do anything. I'm sorry, we can't do that. I mean, you can't, you put this and that, you put mayonnaise on the, on the, on the fish sandwich, you can't put it on my burger, I'm sorry, that's outside of our, they, they wouldn't do it, used to, they wouldn't do it. They just wouldn't do it. And Burger King, that's when Burger King came with that jingle, have it your way. You know, the, the, any way you want it, we'll do it however you want it. You know, you want double pickles, we'll get, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a no pickle, no onion kind of guy. But if you wanted double pickles and double onions over at Burger King, they'd give them to you. Hallelujah. All right. But we've got we've to learn that we're to edify. We are to be effectually working together. I'm to be supplying. Well, I'm the pastor, but, you know, in the body of Christ, I'm to be supplying. You're to be supplying one another. What's this got to do with growing up? Everything. If you can't play nice with people that, or that love the same God, how are you going to play nice with people that hate God? You know, he'll say, I'd rather hang out with sinners than that with Christians. No, that's because you've been ornery. You've been ugly, and God don't like ugly. He may love you, but he don't like it. Amen? Y'all glad you came out tonight? All right. So let's talk about how to grow spiritually. Uh, you know, kind of, this morning, that, that was just kind of getting, getting this large, started. Uh, look over at 1 Peter 2 2. Spiritual growth comes from the Word. I'm going to tell you something. As, as, if, if you're going to grow as a believer, you're going to have to make a decision. If the Word says that I do it, whether I like it or not. Hello? But I've heard people say, God told me I didn't have to do such and such. I don't have to, I don't have to you know, I don't have to be the devil's doormat. That's usually an excuse for you don't have to walk in love. The Lord told me I didn't have to be the devil's doormat. Well, if it's the devil running on, but if it's another believer and you're having, you know, and you're having issues with another believer, you just can't hop, pull that out and throw it down and say, yeah, they're the devil's doormat. They might think you're the devil's doormat. Hello? We have to learn to walk in love. Amen? 1 Peter 2.2. 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye grow thereby. I better back up here a little bit. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. First Peter um, 1.23 says that we're being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of God which lives and abides forever. So we're born of the word. Romans 10, 7, 14 says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. So we're um, born hearing the word. Ephesians 4, 15, 4, 15, if you look back over there real quick, says that speaking the truth in love may grow up in him and all things. What's the truth? Thou sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. So we grow by speaking and hearing the word in love. Ephesians 4, 15 and 15, 14, 15 again talks about not being children. So we uh, mature, amen, by the word, by becoming skillful in the word. And then Hebrews, um, I, I said Ephesians 4, 14 and 15, but Hebrews 5, 13 and 14, look over there. Hebrews 5, 13 and 14. You better back up. Verse 12. 11. Of whom many things are saved and, and hard to be uttered. And he's, talking about, he's been talking about Melchizedek. He says, and, and, and of Melchizedek, uh, there's many things that are to be said, but your heart or hard of hearing are dull of hearing. 
For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, be the, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and become such as need milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a what? A babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even to those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So we mature by acting and living according to the Word, living on the Word. You become skillful. And if you're not practicing it, you'll become as one who needs meat. You'll be a babe. You can revert in your actions. Now, I know a lot of people who started out on fire for the Lord, were turned on to the Lord, turned on the Word, grew, 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 and then got lazy or got hurt and let that hurt become a, a whatever. I'll tell you, you need to take the prism of hurt off of your eyes and see things from God's perspective and not from your perspective of your past. I have seen too many people let the past govern everything they interpret. It's ungodly, it's wrong. You know, well, so-and-so did such and such, and you just did something that's just like them. You, you're just like them. Well, and within the confidence, and that again, that, that's that person setting the parameters of, of, of what everything is. That's not, you can't do that. And you'll never grow doing that. Are you here? I mean, just because, you know, uh, kids, they're growing up, their daddy was an alcoholic, and the kid will do one thing. You're just like your daddy. He's a drunk, you'll be a drunk. How in the world did you get that out of that one action? Because the prism of your experience is governing what you see and not God and His Word. Hello? Um, you can't do that to children. I've seen, I've seen kids put through the ringer because the parents had a prism that they analyzed everything the child did through that prism. And it had nothing to do with the child. It had to do with, with uh, uh, other family members and stuff. And they governed and they interpreted and they analyzed and they assumed everything about the child's action from the prism of past experience. <clears throat> not with the child. It's not past experience with the child, but past experience from other, other things in the family. And that's just like so-and-so. Well, no, it wasn't. You know, it's, it's kind of hard in life not to have people have the same actions that someone else had at some point in time. Hello? It's just kind of hard with, with, with all the people on the planet and with, with, with ex the life experiences. It's hard not to have people do some of the same exact stuff at some point in some time in life. But that don't mean they did it for the same reason, same motive, same purpose, from the same position. But if you've experienced that, you may think it was. You can have somebody. All right, here's, let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Now, back at our home church in, 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 in eastern North Carolina, uh, I, was a, I was a staff member. I was an assistant pastor. And, uh, you know, you can say things and not mean a thing in the world by it. Now, this fellow, kid, this little kid kept me in church one day and, and, and wanted gum, and I, didn't ha and, I, and, and, and I either didn't have any or it was about, I forgot what it was. I forgot why I didn't do it. I couldn't, I couldn't do it or whatever. I, think, I don't think I had any. I said, and I just jokingly said, boy, what did I do? Take you to race? You know, without this, this, just joking, messing around. The mama overheard it. And boy, she went thermonuclear meltdown. She went off on me. I'm talking, I'm like, what? But see, her experience heard me say that. And some things she had experienced with men in, in her child's life, heard, heard. And so she interpreted what I said through that prism. And she went off on me, and I'm like, I didn't mean a thing in the world by it. You know? Just, just a saying. You know, we, people said that all the time. It was just kind of a, just a kind of a saying you said. You didn't mean anything, didn't mean a thing in the world by it. But she interpreted it through the prism of her experience. And when she did, she saw in me something that wasn't there. Not wanting to be responsible, not wanting to love, not wanting to care for, you know, all the kind of stuff that she had experienced. You know, maybe the daddy left said, boy, I ain't taking you to raise and left or something. I don't know. Now, what I, I don't, I wouldn't say that today. After, after that event, I'll never say it again. 
but, but that's what I'm trying to say is I had an action that she had obviously heard in the past from someone who came from a different, who, who meant something totally different by it. But I, re, I said the same thing and all she could interpret was her experience of the, that action and not what was really behind it. We have to grow beyond that. You're going to encounter people and they're going to do some of the same things to you that somebody else did and don't want me a thing in the world by it. You'll have people who will forget to make an appointment. They don't mean they don't love you. They just forgot. They're bad about time management or whatever. They, just, they were just bad about it. They didn't do the right, you know. And, and then they realized they did it and they, they're sorry. But, you know, by the time you, they call you, you're so worked up and so mad and so ticked because somebody somewhere in your life was always letting you down because this person let you down. You interpreted everything they did through that, through that prism. That's not spiritual maturity. Say, oh, me, amen, help me, Jesus. Or, Pastor, can you pray for me right now? Get the holy water out. Throw it on me. <laughs> Glory to God. Get my toes straightened out. Amen. Y'all hear? We have to be of strong meat. We have to become a full age. We have to walk in ways where we, we see people through the... That's why uh, the love chapter is put in the Bible. Love's ever... You know, the Amplified Bible says it really good. Love is ever ready to believe the best of every person. Well, I know people that... Boy, the, I mean, they're always looking for the way to believe the worst. One, one situation I'm thinking about, where, uh, parents had a child, and I don't care what that child did. As soon as they did something, it was a major conference and, you know, and, and cracked down and whipped and had to have a major discussion and theological discussion and, and have a counseling analysis of why they did that action. They're a kid. They, you can't live under that kind of scrutiny because you'll eventually begin to rebel against that pressure. Nobody can live under that kind of pressure. It'd be like every time you came. If you came into church late, and I, every time you came in church two minutes late, I pulled you off the side. Let me tell you something now. You're, <coughs> you're showing signs of lack of commitment to the Lord. You don't love the Lord Jesus. You need to repent and get right with God every single time. You'd rebel against that eventually. And seeing everything was always analyzed about something from the past, you know. And that's just like so and so. Well, that's not God. I said, that's not God. You've seen too many drunk kids of drunks. Parents always say, you're just like your daddy, you'd be a drunk. And they end up being a drunk. Why? You told them they would be. See them through the prison of God's Word. You won't be like your, you won't, you won't fall to the shortcomings your father fell to. The good traits you'll have, the bad ones you won't walk in. You'll walk in the godly things of God. Amen. Y'all hear you going home. See, you're going to have to grow up and, and be a supplier. Well, let's let me say that. Now, then we're talking about individual family situations, but I'll tell you what, that same stuff comes into the church. Hello? And so the pastor might say something from the pulpit. Now, I'll tell you, you say something about, you know, submission. And somebody's been in a shepherding church, well, they'll get it right out the back door. <coughs> they'll go crazy. Oh, he used that word shepherding. Or he used that word submission. He, he's of the devil. I've been in a shepherding church. Well, I'm not a shepherding church. I don't, I don't want to know if you went to, you know, what time you go to the bathroom, if we go to work at 4 o'clock or 6 o'clock or tell you when you can go on vacation. That's none of my business. I don't care. Amen. You don't have to check in with the elder before you make a financial decision to buy a car or not. That's your business. I said, that's your business. I don't care if you buy a new car. Let me rejoice with you if you can, if, if you can afford it and that's what you want and you can do it. Praise God. I'm with you. Glad for you. You don't have to get my permission on what color to buy. <coughs> but see, because somebody's experienced, so what you got to do? You've got to overcome. Now, I'm going to tell you something. A lot of people, a lot of people, let me give you a, an example you can lay your, your, bite into. How many remember PTL? The Jim and Tammy Club. You know, people, you know, the Praise the Lord program. People, whatever they wanted to call it. You know, now, now Jim used to be with Pat Robertson. And then he left and went down to Charlotte. Actually, he was involved with helping start PTL, um, TBN. TBN left there and ended up coming to Charlotte and started PTL. And we all know what happened down there. That thing got a mess. They got all that extravagant. They got into all kinds of stuff. Selling uh, timeshares 
but they were selling them illegally because they were selling the timeshare for one timeshare. Somewhere, somewhere they got spending too much money. They had 2,000 checking accounts. One of the first things they did when they got sold and somebody got a hold of it was they stripped that down in the first month to 167 and got it down to two. What are they doing? They were writing checks and depositing. They just kept a trail constantly of depositing from this account to that account to this account to that account on the float, and they lived on the float. 2,000 accounts, buddy, you, could, you take some time for that to float. Anyway, but um, somewhere they got, you know, they started out going to build this Christian village and Christian theme park and Christian that and Christian that. Every time that happens, it fails. You know, and I, and I went down there when it still was running. I went down to a, you know, Heritage USA and stayed in the hotel and they had the top hat and the five star, you know, all this stuff. And it was, it was cool. But at the same time, if I want to go shopping at a mall, I don't have to be a Holy Ghost tongue tongue talker that I'm buying from. Now, if they put up, I hate America and I hate Jesus, I probably won't buy from them. That's my choice as a, as a citizen and as a, as a Christian. All right. Um, but, you know, they, they started building this. They started building these hotels. They built the Heritage Grand. They started building these things. And, and you were going to get a, a, a timeshare for life. And one of these things went to you. You could come down there and enjoy the theme park and go to the prayer tower. Or the prayer, not prayer tower, that's for Oral Roberts. But go to the prayer room and, you know, the upper room. The upper room. They had the upper room. All that stuff. Well, they got to spending too much money. So what they started doing was they were put a plans up for another thing and started selling timeshares to it, but they were using that money to finish this one. That's when they started really getting in trouble. And and then of course the affair went on with Jessica Hahn and all that stuff and you know and you know and all the crazy stuff and then the, the extravagance of the of the, the twenty four karat gold uh, plated lavatory sinks and all this kind of stuff. I mean it just you know all the excessiveness. You know, listen, you know, you don't have to go crazy to walk in prosperity. It's hard it's hard for people to give money to something when you're not, not just living good, you're living beyond extravagant. You don't need 24 karat gold plated stuff to prove that you, God wants to bless you in the bathrooms. Hello. And all that stuff that was going on and all, I mean, there was, there was, there was rumors of homosexuality and, there was, and they started bringing in people who were gimmick preachers that were, that were operating in familiar spirits and not in the Holy Ghost and that kind of stuff. And I won't, I won't talk about the names of those people. And they, but they were always, they, all they ever did, they'd sit on the set with construction hats on because they were always raising money to build the next thing. Hello. And they just kept doing that and doing that. And doing it. Finally fell apart. You would not believe the number of born-again, spirit-filled Christians who left and went to non-spirit-filled churches and won't have anything to do with it or giving money to anything because of that event. They got burned. And because of that, they won't have anything to do with, with they don't, they don't, you know, you can't talk about giving. Boy, as soon as the preacher starts talking about giving, he, they think he's a charlatan like, like the Jim and Tammy. And he's gone the opposite way. Now he talks about, you know, that God don't want us to prosper. So of course, he's making money talking about that God don't want you to prosper and stuff, you know. I, I just love that. I mean, preachers go out and preach, about, preach against prosperity and then receive an offering. If you're going to go out and preach against prosperity, don't receive an offering. Say, well, God, God wants us all to be poverty and poverty. So I, I don't receive offerings because God wants us to be poor. Hello? So that prism, that prism and those people's lives ruined them. You can't get them to give to buy a donkey a, uh, a, a hat with holes in it for his ears. And well, people did this, they were ruined by that. Well, that's not someone who's skillful in the word of righteousness. Or the Word of God. Number one, they got caught up in that stuff because they were immature in the first place. Had they been mature, they wouldn't have bought a timeshare in that place. They would have looked historically and found out, listen, when the church got too comfortable living together, a, a, a dispersing came and they were scattered all over, all over the place. Remember? When, 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 they, when the dispersing of the church came, took place and they were dispersed abroad, they got, they got too comfortable living in their community together and not busy about doing the will of God. God wants you to go out, go out there where the sinners are and help them. Not live in your 
little Christian village, with your Christian shopping center, with your Christian boss, getting to go to prayer in the upper room every day at lunch. Hallelujah. It's just so wonderful here. Yeah, but there's a world dying and going to hell right outside your gates. I said, there's a world dying and going to hell right outside your gates. See, that was just immature in the first place. Now, it's also immature to begin to in, 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 uh, see everything through that prism. That everybody mentions money is just a charlatan. And we, got, we have charlatans. There was a guy, I remember when we first came to Greensboro. I'm not going to finish this tonight. So, that's a good thing that we... Didn't wait till next Sunday to try to finish it. Hallelujah. But this guy came to Greensboro. When we first came to Greensboro uh, a number of years ago, there was this guy. He was at the Coliseum. Had rented, um, uh, not, not the Coliseum part, you know, he was, was at the Greensboro Col in War Memorial St Auditorium, which is, you know, where you, you set up. And, and Copeland had his meeting in there uh, and so forth uh, a number of years, uh, about five or six years ago when he was here. He, he went over to one side and had a meeting in there. And, you know, you, you could set up and have meetings in there. And, and this guy was having a meeting there. Well, some of the people from the church went over and they came back and, and, uh, they were a little bit disappointed. See, so they had gone the year before and just, oh man, thought this guy was awesome. He was great. He was super. He was stupendous. I mean, he flowed in the word of knowledge and, and everything and God was all over him and so forth. And he got to take up an offering. And he started saying, now I need for y'all to do this, 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 this. And started giving methods to get people to give money. And he turned around to his, his, uh, his cohort. You know, some of these guys traveling have, and I, I, I'm not, I have no problem with that, having a traveling person that, that keeps integrity in the ministry, keeps you, keeps women out of your room and all that kind of stuff, your accountability and that kind of, I, I get that. Totally get that. You don't need some woman knocking. And their women are, fun, are interested. They'll find out where you are if they want, want to bad enough. They'll figure out what hotel you're in and come knocking on your door. They'll, tell, they'll be front desk telling you they're your wife and you got there late and you're, and you're, you're ready to, you know, you, you need to get up to the room. And clerks will give them the room number. Hello. I tell you, there's some, there's some, there's some floozies out there. <laughs> Hallelujah. I, I knew one pastor said, he saw a woman knocking on his door at 1 o'clock in the morning and said, and came and said, I just, I just went, and he, 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 he said, you're going away from here. And yeah, you get away from here. Jesse said one time, a woman came up and, and started telling him she wanted to go to bed with him. He started hollering right in the airport, Jezebel, Jezebel. I mean, she took off running. <laughs> Or, or whore of Babylon. <laughs> oh my. Amen. So, um, where was I before I talked about the hotel? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And so he turned around to the guy and said, I've never done it like this before in my life, have I? He's, nope. We've never received an offer like this before ever, have we? Nope. And the guys that had come from our church that went over there, because I didn't, I just don't run off to every meeting just because somebody shows up in town. You know what I'm saying? Especially if I don't know who they are and don't know anything about their ministry, I just don't run over there. I like to find out some stuff before I go walking in. Um, when it's not, when it's being put on by a church, it's a little bit different because you're, you're trusting that pastor to have some discernment about who they invited in. Does that make sense? Yeah. You're, you're trusting the pastor to discern some things and to have a relationship and that kind of stuff. And it's not just, but somebody putting on their own meeting and just showing up down and putting on their own meeting and, and not having anything to do with the local churches when they come in. Do -do 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 -do. Something kind of little beep beep goes off on that one. Well, they came back and they said, they said, Pastor Ed, I'll just tell you. I said, they were, we were just last year, we just enjoyed that meeting so much, and, and we gave and thought God was going to do this for us and all that, and we were promised that God was going to bless us and do all this stuff. And, and, uh, but this year he came back and said he did the exact same thing he did last year, but said, I've never done it like this before. Turned around and asked the guy that worked with him in the ministry, have I ever done this? Nope, never done it like this before ever. It was the same gimmick. Just forgot, he'd, or either, either they forgot they did it here last year, or they were just hoping there's enough people there that weren't here the year before, they wouldn't know it. Or they were just dumb enough to forget. Hello, from the previous year. Well, that can burn you. But you've got to grow up and understand they're charlatans. As a mature Christian, that is Satan using something to try to put something in my life where I won't follow the plan of God because somebody's not walking according to the will of God. You can't let somebody who's wrong keep you from doing what's right. That's like people say, well, I ain't never get, I'm just going to live, I'm just going to shack up. I ain't going to live with, my, I'm going to just live and shack up with somebody. I ain't going to get married again. Uh, if you're going to be a Christian, you better get married. 
and stop sacking. God, I got the holy hush look just then. I didn't, I didn't get a holy grunt. I just got a holy hush. We have to let the Word of God dictate our actions and be the prism through which we see the circumstances of life. Amen. Hallelujah. Because we don't lack anything, we just have undeveloped skills. Listen, you, you, you know, what else he said here? He said in verse 13, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. There's a lot of people who are just unskillful. If we can learn to develop that, we'll be able to discern right and wrong. Amen? Isn't that right? It says here, in verse 14, look there. But strong meat belongs to them that are full age, even to those whose senses, who by reason of use, have their senses exercised to do what? Discern both good and evil. You become able to discern what's right and wrong, what's, what the motives and stuff are. What, what does Hebrews 4.12 say? Look over there. The Word of God is quick, or a living thing, powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and the marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, I'm going to tell you something. It will be a discerner of the thoughts and intents of your heart. It will also teach you how to discern properly. Not judge, but discern wrong intent by people when they're doing stuff and protect you and keep you out of trouble. Amen. Boy, I'll tell you, somebody, Pastor, we love you. We're for you. I've had them tell me that I'm for you. We believe in you. You're the best thing. You're the best thing since peanut butter and sliced bread and about to stick a knife in your back as soon as you turn around. Hello. You, you know, sometimes you just know something's not right about somebody, you know, when they're blowing wind up your skirt and they're puffing everything, telling you how wonderful you are and how great you are, and, all that, and you just know something ain't right about it. But see, if, you, if, if you're skillful in the Word of God, the Word of righteousness, you'll learn to discern those things without, without being judgmental. You'll just know when to watch out and to guard and protect and not be, not be caught unawares. You don't have to go... Pound them in the ground saying, you're a lying dog, I discerned your lying, all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's not what's, that's not what it's talking about. But the Word of God will, will train you to rightly discern things. Keep you out of trouble. Amen. I said amen. But let me say something here. While we're kind of along these lines, on some of these things, don't, don't tell me you can have wrong actions all the time and expect people to know your heart. Well, my heart is this. Well, why don't you do this? If it's really your heart, you're going to do it. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Well, I was doing such and such that you should have known my heart. I'm sorry. I don't know your heart. I know your actions. And I had to discern by your actions. And the Word of God's going to show me by your actions what's right and wrong. Well, you should know what I'm thinking. What do you think I am? God? The only one that knows what you're thinking is God and you. Hello? That was an enthusiastic response. Amen. But as we learn to live according to the Word, feed in the Word, do the Word, act on the Word, act in accordance with the Word, we'll be able to rightly see things for what they are and make the right uh, decision about how, to, how either to or not to be involved in that circumstance or situation from a biblical perspective without being ugly. You don't have to be ugly. You don't have to be mean. You don't have to be judgmental. Amen. You don't have to barbecue them on the grill. Amen. 
Isn't that right? Now let me say this. In order for a body to grow corporately, the individuals have to grow, indiv uh, the, 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 each member has to grow individually. Now again, First Peter 2, 2 says that we're desirous and seal milk of the word that we may grow thereby. Um, so as we grow individually in accordance with the word, then that aids, back over to Ephesians 4, aids in the corporate growth. If, you, if everybody began to grow individually in supply, then the body would grow. Amen. The body would grow. Ephesians 4.14 again, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in the weight, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things. See, if each one of us are growing up into him, if we're, if we're not being children, if we're not being tossed to and fro, we're not bringing false doctrine in the church, trying to prove we're right and pastor's wrong, we got a better, I mean, I'm, there are people sitting at Raymond Bible Church right now and sitting in the services where Pastor Hagin is teaching and disagree with him about grace. Right, sitting right there in the church, fussing. Leave. Get up and leave. Just go. You immature rascal. You baby. Are you here? fussing about it. Then go out and post all over Facebook how, the, how they're, uh, about their teaching and their doctrine and all this kind of stuff. One of the instructors got fed up with one of the kids because they, they rebuked Jessica and he, he jumped in because he didn't like the way he, they rebuked Jessica about something she said. And he started correcting the guy and the guy started rebuking the, the dean. He found that the kid, the kid, the kid was, was involved in the ministry on a certain level and he, he said, are you now instructing me? I mean, he, you know, he kind of got rough with him. That arrogance gets in there. You know, you're not, you're not building, you're tearing down. Trying to create your own little groups within the, within the corporate is wrong. We're supposed to be working towards the same cause. In, in military terms, on a, on, a, on a ship, they call it mutiny. And it's considered treasonous activity. Aren't you glad the church doesn't deal with it like they do? Hang them at sea. Drop their body in the ocean. <laughs> That's what they used to do. They'd hang them from the, the things, and then they cut it down and bury them at sea. Everybody got a good view of what happens when you, when you try to mutiny on board. Amen? No, the body's supposed to be working, the body's supposed to be working to grow together. Well, I got a revelation. Well, I'm glad you got a revelation. When you've got that revelation, you've walked it out for 35 years or 40 years like the ministers that these people are trying to come against, uh, come back and talk to me then. Young whippersnapper who's been walking in it for three days. Boy, I got a hold of something that nobody else got a hold of. There ain't no such thing as a new revelation. It's all been, it's all been revealed before. And most new revelations are old heresies, just packaged in a new box. Yeah. Oh, I got a revelation nobody else has. <laughs> Hogwash, Tommy Rot, baloney. No, we're to grow. We're to mature. We're to work together for the common good and the, and the wholeness of the body so that the body can be effectual and working. What? They understand that a healthy body is more able to do the will of God than an unhealthy body. Dissension in the church is of the devil. I said it's of the devil. Sorry. Little Bill gets upset when I get out of the light. Because then I go dark. Hallelujah. We're going dark. <laughs> All right. Hallelujah. You see, the importance of individual growth is to bring us to the place that the individuals who've grown now supply effectually, their suppliers to the corporate body to make the corporate body whole and healthy. Amen. And when we get whole and healthy as a corporate body, then we're able to do things we can't do if we're not whole. Now, using electricity, you know, you know this, if, you should know this, that if there's a short somewhere in a line, it'll drain electricity. Um, I remember a number of years ago, 
in our first home, um, we were sitting there one night, and all the lights started going brown. You know, you heard, you heard a brown out. Lights started dimming brown and brown and brown and brown. And that went on for a little while with, oh, man, this is not good, because it's not good for your appliances or anything. You're not getting full voltage. The right amount of current's not coming in. You don't have the right amps coming to the equipment. It's try, you know, and, it's, and because it's not getting it, it's trying to draw harder to get them. And that's what starts happening to me because, and wherever, whatever's wrong is, that puts more stress on that point. Till eventually, we heard something go, boom! No power. <laughs> it burnt, it just, just cut the whole line right in two. We, and we had, we, we had a breach in, in our line coming from the, the, the transformer to the house. It was underground wiring. And uh, as, it, as it was there, it was feeding electricity into the ground. That's why electric wires have to be buried so many feet, so far down, is because if it's ble bleeding full current, it has to be far enough from the ground that current can't reach the surface and electrocute somebody stepping on it. That's why it's done that way. That's why they bury X, X number of feet. They know that it only that current will only carry so far in the ground at full current. So that somebody can't walk out there on a, on, a, on a breached area and get electrocuted because there's so much current coming. If you bury it too shallow, it'll kill them. So they bury it deep enough that it, when it's breached, it'll feed into the ground. It'll just keep going into the ground until eventually the whole wire just burns in two. Well, that's what happened to our house. There was a breach in the, in the, in the cable. Somewhere it probably got nicked at some point in time, maybe when, even when they put it in. And it just over time, that, that constant extra drain on that spot kept making it get worse, 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 until it finally, it finally just pulled, too many, pulled so much in there that it, it, it burned it in half. Now, a little funny side note on this story is, uh, so we call, they come out and they drop a temporary cable that night. Duke Power drops temporary cable. In other words, they just drop one on top of the ground and run up to the house. And then their guys are going to come out the next day and look for the breach. They, but, they, but they got his power back on for the night. Okay? <clears throat> and... Um, so the guy, they have this prong thing that has a meter in the middle, and it has two prongs on the end, and they stick it in the ground, and it reads. And, and it goes down, and it's, it could pick up the line. And when it finds the breach, you put it down, and nothing's happening because one's hitting the line that's got the power in it, and nothing's over here. And so they, oh, there, here it is. Well, about the time, there's this big black guy. I mean, he's he like a football player. Gentle giant. He's a gentle giant, but he was a big guy. I mean, he was about 6'4", 270, 280. Big guy had the utility hat on. He's out there and, and stuff. And about the time he's putting it in the ground, I came out the side door. We had a wooden screen door. So I came in, it had a spring on it. And I walked out, and when that door went, it went BAM! At the same time, he put that thing in the ground. I'm telling you, that fella jumped about four foot up in the air. <laughs> Came down holding his heart. <laughs> Scared the daylights out of him. <laughs> you know what I'm doing. I'm laughing my back end off up there. You know? <laughs> and, 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 about a, and after he got himself back together, he got to laughing about it. He thought it was hilarious. Oh my! But that that door hit just as he put that thing in the ground. He thought he had he had hit something and it was blowing up on him. <laughs> Praise the Lord! Praise God! But when that breach was there, it was, it was losing power. Power was draining out into the ground. My lights were on, but they started going dim. Why? And they started browning out. Why? Because they weren't getting the right amps. Why? Because the electricity was breached. All the wire wasn't supplying properly. It had stopped supplying the way it was supposed to supply and had become bleeding out into the earth and electricity was being lost. And you see, when there's a breach in the church of people not walking as mature believers and walking according to the Word of God, we're, we're, we're just, we're, we're draining power out into nothingness and the church enters into a brownout phase. It's running, but it ain't running right. And it keeps trying to draw, but there's, it, it, because the breach is not getting the full supply of the power that it needs to get the job done. And eventually, if that's not dealt with soon enough, that breach will completely cut the power off. It's all the work of the enemy. Don't be a breach. Be a breach repairer. Amen? And I'll walk by and slam the door while you're doing it. Hallelujah. So, 
<coughs> as, we, as we individually mature and individually supply, the body matures and grows. Amen? Hallelujah. Look at Acts 4.32. We want to close. We'll close over here. Pick back up next Sunday morning. Acts 4.32. And the multitude of them believed that were one of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them they had all the things which they possessed with his own, but they had all things in common. When the church got to the point that the whole was more important than the individual, miracles, signs, wonders took place. What do I mean the whole is more important than the individual? It doesn't mean you starve and do without. It means you put your flesh under, you deny yourself some things, you deny yourself the right to be right upon occasion or all the time because it's good for the body. Hello. Well, what about me? Immature. That's just a sign of immaturity. Hello. Babies come into the world, all they care about is them. They don't care that you got to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and feed and change them. They're wet and they're hungry and they demand change. Are you here or are you going home? As they grow, they'll make less demands and do more for themselves. And when they mature, they get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and change the diaper and feed the baby. Hello. They don't lie there and kick their feet up in there and say, Man, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Are you here? Change my diaper, whatever the adult things they call them. I forgot they call them. Anybody know what they call them? Huh? Depends. I want my depends changed. I want my milk bottle. If you're doing that at 35, there's a problem. You haven't matured. No, babies start out demanding everything for them. Eventually, eventually, they become the ones supplying, amen, and taking care of the babies. And that should be taking place in the church. We should be maturing. Yeah, you're going to come in, you're going to be babes. And when they're going to have babes, and they're going to have to grow. But when you grow, as you grow, there's a transformation to where others become important. Amen. Many children end up taking care of their parents when the parents get old. Uh, amen. Get old and, you know, a lot feeble or whatever. The kids come in and start taking care of them. All those years the parents took care of the kids, and now the kids are taking care of the parents. It happens all the time. Well, you know, and, you know, and usually you have in a family the kid that does it and the kid that won't. I'm trusting I've, we've raised our kids right. But you usually have the families that like that. They got the one that'll do everything and, and everything, and the one that won't do a thing. Hello. Because they never grew up. <laughs>